Uh, we'll start the session uh, briefly. Uh, thanks so much for showing up. Um, really happy to see a packed room. Um, today we'll be uh, talking about uh, uh, something a bit specific and uh, eventful day that we had uh, 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 kind of a year ago at CERN now. Um, so my name is R Ricardo. And I'm Spiros. Yeah, we'll be talking about the day where we deleted a significant amount of our production workloads and uh, everything that comes with it and uh, how we, we live through the day. And hopefully this will be a bit entertaining as well. Uh, so well, welcome to our therapy session. I think this is a, way, a good way to describe it. Um, this is uh, our way to, to deal with it after a year as well. So again, I'm a computing engineer at CERN. I work uh, a lot in Kubernetes containers, a bit of machine learning as well. I'm also uh, uh, have a couple of roles in the CNCF. I'm in the TOC, uh, and also I co-lead the CNCF Research User Group. Um, I work at the cloud team at CERN, uh, working a lot of with Kubernetes, uh, OpenStack, and networking. So a few numbers about the infrastructure that we try to eliminate. <laughs> Uh, we have uh, currently, after the incident we'll describe, like uh, more than 400 clusters, uh, almost 3,000 nodes, and quite a few cores and RAM, as you can see, like 15,000, 36 terabytes of RAM. In the first pie chart, you see the grouping of clusters like per group. You see that we have a few, let's say, power users that have quite a few clusters. And on the second pie chart, you see the number of uh, nodes that they have. Like you can see that the second user, which is the color is matching, uh, has uh, quite a few more nodes with less clusters, so they have bigger clusters. So um, about the production Kubernetes service we have at CERN, it's a central API service that users can provision uh, clusters. It's like one-click provisioning for their clusters, and then they can scale them up, down, add different kinds of nodes. And like uh, the purpose of this service is that to allow users to create uh, clusters with different flavors, different Kubernetes versions, to select an HA control plane or not, and they can select which kind, which add-ons they want, which CNI, which CSI drivers enabled, monitoring if they want, what kind of fingers controller. And um, in our IT department and also, but also other departments in the organization. We have multiple teams that uh, consume the service, and they run multiple IT services, each team. And they have usually some production clusters, at least one QA and a few testing clusters. And there are also like personal environments for users to experiment with new technologies and learn new things. Um, one of the reasons that um, uh, users uh, or teams have multiple clusters is that they treat their clusters as cattle. Uh, they try to implement best, serve, best practices um, and not have like single points of failure. Usually they create one cluster and then they start adding more clusters. And usually those clusters are, are behind a single or like multiple load balancers so that uh, they can distribute the load, they can do red green deployments, and they can roll out new features, new clusters, like new versions. As you can see here, for example, they can have like 121, 122, they can add later 123, et cetera. All right, so uh, as Piers said, we, we have uh, quite a few clusters. We have this model where we offer cluster as a service, a bit like a public cloud provider would do. We offer this internally. I'll, I'll go quickly through some of the use cases we have for this. Uh, the important thing is that what we are talking here is mostly about services. There are some specialized deployments as well of Kubernetes that are single use case and can be kind of large scale as well. I'll mention one as an example. So the first example of something that runs in this uh, service where we try to delete the full thing. Um, it's, uh, it's, uh, Atlas is one of the big experiments uh, at CERN for the Large Hadron Collider. Uh, it's a big uh, um, um, physics uh, detector that is underground, and they have pretty big numbers. They generate a lot of data, and just to have an idea of the scale of the thing, we can see they actually move something like 50 petabytes of data a week. They generate a lot, but they also move it around between CERN and other centers, and also within CERN in different places. Uh, so the control plane for that and all the bookkeeping that needs to be done to, to do all of this is run and managed through uh, the Kubernetes service. Uh, another one is... Uh, um, 
physicists uh, publish a lot of uh, uh, articles and they need a nice way to, to kind of find this data. So this is also something we run uh, in this service. Um, there's a team that runs this Inspire, um, Inspire HEP and HEP data projects. And this is a nice portal where they do some sort of uh, also machine learning over the papers and then they, do, they uh, allow people to discover nice content to, to go through for their uh, research topics. Uh, and then even the campus services. So if any, I, I've been, I've seen a lot of people that are either still at CERN or were at CERN before during the conference. So if if you see these logos, it probably doesn't mean much to you. But if you've been at CERN before working, all of this is very familiar. These are all the internal services we use for all sorts of things. Uh, they are kind of critical, and uh, we also uh, run them in the service. Uh, you can see it's. Uh, it's kind of, uh, even if it's just for the campus management, because it's a large organization, it, it can be quite big. So they have like a total of 400 nodes just for this in the different services. All right, and then as I mentioned, this is kind of the uh, managed uh, Kubernetes that we offer on demand. Uh, there's also use cases where uh, they are much larger scale and more critical uh, and things like running the, the actual triggers or the event filters for the experiment. So I mentioned Atlas before. Uh, you can see a picture of the, of the detector there. Generates one petabyte a second, needs to reduce that to something like 10 gigabytes a second. Traditionally, they've been doing this uh, using a large CPU cluster. They are evolving that to use GPUs and uh, other resources. But actually, the big transition they will do in the uh, next couple of years is that we did an evaluation where we, what they want to do is instead of having their traditional way of managing applications there, they want to run a large Kubernetes cluster. And the reasons for that is the flexibility and changing the workloads and, and managing them. Uh, so just to have an idea of what they are trying to do, um, they, they run something like 30,000 applications at any moment when there's Beam running. When the beam stops, they want to switch that to simulation workloads, and they have to do this in like one minute or two. And when beam comes back up, they have to relaunch the 30,000 applications again in, within one minute. So we, we did a lot of work also with six scalability in Kubernetes to make this scale. We had a test cluster that had two and a half thousand nodes and where we cooked these numbers that you see here and we uh, verified that this can work. So the production cluster will actually be a single cluster with 5,000 nodes that will be serving uh, the critical part of the Atlas experiment computing. So let's start going uh, to the event that we will describe today. Uh, this is like a spoiler alert. In the end, uh, things went fine, but even that I see it now, it still gets me a bit stressed. <laughs> But uh, it kind of worked, and also our colleagues were quite nice with us, and they were very understanding. So the incident was that um, uh, by accident, uh, we had a maintenance tool that started to delete uh, the full production uh, that we had. And thankfully, it tried to do that uh, one by one, so not everything in one go. Uh, it actually deleted on almost 120 clusters. And uh, thankfully, this resulted, okay, initially we didn't know that it was only degradation and loss of capacity, but there was no downtime for like, uh, n like no production services had downtime, no, only a few like testing, testing instances. Next one. Sorry. So the root cause is that this main transcript that I described, so we had implemented like a, a, reg a tool that we run regularly to clean up uh, like orphan clusters and orphan clusters are Kubernetes clusters that have their VMs deleted and uh, load balancers and other related computer storage resources. But there are still entries in the database uh, of the service and this makes it a bit cumbersome for us to do operations, uh, uh, do monitoring and take metrics of the service. So reg regularly we just clean up, similar to what the control loop would do, but uh, it's like an external tool. Um, the resolution to fix uh, the incident was to just to recreate whatever the tool had deleted. But this was quite challenging, as we will see in the next slides. Yeah, so I'll start with this. So we'll go through the timeline of the day. So the day started as uh, most days start at CERN, which is over coffee and a lot of discussion. Uh, this was uh, early in the morning. Uh, over coffee, we usually talk about dark energy, dark matter, and the expanding universe. Uh, actually, not really. Uh, th this particular day, we were actually discussing the change we were about to apply. Even if we 
didn't feel it was like a big change, we still review what we're about to do during the day. So Spurs will give a bit more details. So there were discussions like, okay, everything is fine, let's do it, it's a small change, it's nothing big. Uh, we have tested this. Uh, all, all the return codes and tests are correct. We spent uh, two, three weeks validating this, so everything will go fine. That was before lunch. <laughs> Next. <laughs> so at 2.30, we said, okay, we'll go for lunch. Everything is fine. And then we clicked it and we started. And uh, well, we were waiting a bit to, to, for the tool to kick in, and then we will start monitoring the logs. And a few minutes after, like one or two minutes after the, the start of the script, like one of my colleagues from the identity service came in and said, I think we're hacked. Like all the identities of the clusters are getting deleted. I said, don't worry, it's fine. I'm, we're just do, do, doing this to clean up the orphan cluster. So it's expected. And then the other colleague that the registry, uh, the container registry runs in a Kubernetes cluster that we, we eat our own food. Uh, he said, I don't see the registry clusters. Something must be wrong. So I was a bit worried, so I clicked the abort button to stop all, the, all of this. And then I tried to list the set clusters because I thought, OK, maybe my colleague was looking at the wrong project or was doing something wrong in his environment. But uh, it turns out that it wasn't. And uh, the next minutes were felt a bit like the next slide, <laughs> like this one. <laughs> It lasted a few minutes in this mode, and then I, I passed by Ricardo's office, and he will. Yeah, so the, the next few minutes after this, uh, this is a very important point in any organization, and CERN takes a lot of care about the safety of everyone. So this is actually a, a screenshot from the learning catalog at CERN. Anyone can apply for this training. It's first aid and life-saving. It says things like, uh, uh, how to react in, of, in case of external hemorrhage, uh, wounds, loss of consciousness, which is pretty much what was about to happen here. Uh, so it's also very important that the target audience is all personnel working at CERN, which covers also IT people. So this is what, uh, what uh, we had to do for, for, for the next couple of seconds at least. Uh, this is an actual picture of the defibrillators and, uh, and fire extinguishers you can see can find that CERN. So this lasted a couple of minutes, then we kind of calmed down and started looking into the issue. So around, uh, like what is important here is that we started this operation at like 2.35, 2.39 we detected it. Uh, we got the first report from a user about something is wrong, like really wrong, uh, around 41. So we got this, uh, we were also getting alarms and things, but uh, uh, those we kind of were ignoring, uh, trying to understand exactly what were ha was happening because there was way too much coming. Uh, so some user reported that the UI for the registry is failing for me. This is okay. Something is big. So we spent the next 45 minutes after this uh, trying to do an assessment. I, we understood, okay, something went really wrong. How do, we, how do we deal with this? And this was really important to, to kind of structure this. So the first thing, first thing to see is like what's still up and what's not. So we immediately identified that one of the services that was down, and actually the only service that was down, uh, was the registry. And the reason for that is that um, we actually got unlucky, let's say like this, and we deleted all the registry clusters behind it, uh, which ended up bringing down the service. Now, Normally, uh, and we've tested uh, adding new clusters, this wouldn't be a big issue. Um, and we could get the cluster back and, and the service back in a couple of minutes. Uh, in this case, it wasn't quite the case, and we'll go into a bit more detail of why this was the case uh, in, in this event. At the same time, we were lucky because we ran the registry clusters, right. that it was the only service. So. One, one thing that became very clear also after this experience is that the registry is really like completely critical. It's important to launch new new applications. Of course, like for stuff that is running and that we didn't delete, uh, it, they kept running without a registry. But if you delete the cluster of your users and you ask them to recreate, it's kind of critical to have a, a registry running. So this was the first priority. And what we did is we branched out the team. So there were people focusing on, OK, go get the registry back and do whatever is needed. And the rest of us, we started doing the rest, uh, what was needed on the other side, which is basically, this is way too big 
to, to do the normal procedure. So let's start contacting the different teams um, at CERN to fully understand what's the impact in their own service. And this was really essential. Uh, so the COVID era actually helped a lot because we have this direct communication even using Zoom uh, with many of the services and we basically established this communication. We had quick calls with them. What's up? What, how can we help? Is it down? And what we started realizing is that no one was down. I think there was one case of a service that was down, but most services were saying, okay, we are still up, we're degraded, but we're still up. So this kind of helped us uh, kind of relax a bit. And the reason that, uh, that uh, uh, these services were still up is again back to these clusters as cattle and uh, the dissemination we've been doing internally uh, for, for best practices on GitOps and automation. And I, I show here like the, our best user. Uh, it's a team that manages multiple services. You can see here, uh, actually I see the person there, so it's even better. And this is uh, one, one of the, uh, like the most well-behaved user. And it, you can see what the impact of this event was for his own service or the, the team services. You have like, for each of the services they're maintaining, they have something like eight clusters in total. We deleted six. And still, the service was still running. So for the other ones, in some cases, none was impacted, but in no case, we actually had uh, a loss of complete capacity. And um, this is really a shout out to everyone uh, uh, in the CERN teams also for, for doing the right thing. Uh, this took quite a long time to contact everyone. So really, it's, it was really important to branch out and do uh, and split the tasks. Uh, you can see on the right plot, you can see a similar view in number of nodes. Of course, the services were not behaving as expected, um, but, but it helped quite a bit. So yeah, as Ricardo mentioned, like the first part was to bring the registry up. Um, and we didn't realize that we had created the circular, circular dependency in the Kubernetes service by introducing uh, the Harbor registry. Before the Harbor registry, we were using the GitLab registry. And then we set up Harbor and we are advertising to users to, to consume it, set up uh, like rules for um, making immutable tags and using uh, vulnerability scans, etc. And then we thought we should use the same best practices and we started using them. But by, by doing this, we created the circular dependency I mentioned. So it was quite critical for um, our colleagues, uh, for our team members that were at the task to, to bring it up. And they managed to do it quite, quite fast. We were also um, kind of lucky because the load balancer was, not, was untouched. So the DNS name, certificates, all of that would be easy uh, to bring back. So this lasted like 40 minutes, I think, or, or, or something. And then uh, users would be able to start recreating uh, their clusters. And next slide. Yeah, so usually this would take like uh, maybe five to 10 minutes to bring it back because of the circular dependencies and some uh, workarounds we had to apply it took something like 45 minutes. And so for the majority of services, as soon as we notified users that, okay, everything is fine now for the registry, you can move on, like adding capacity to your services back. And most of them took them like uh, 15 minutes, maybe 30 some. And then at the end of the long tail, there were some cases that needed more, more time because they had special firewall rules that are not managed centrally, like DNS name propagation that uh, were kind of special and manual, manual steps, which shows that Everything that involved manual steps was a bit slower because the services were, was built like that uh, uh, in, a, in a very long time. So in the incident, they had to re recreate everything very fast. And uh, then we did a, a survey to understand what happened and uh, how it was fixed and how everything came back. And really, GitOps helped a lot here. And as we can see with the survey, uh, even for cluster provisioning, uh, there were quite some best practices used by, by our users. They were using Terraform. Um, others wanted to use Terraform, but because of the setup of their cluster and the lack of feature support in the provider, uh, they were not using it, but they wanted to. Uh, Crossplane also is the ultimate goal, but uh, it's not available yet for our environment. Uh, other users had very detailed documentation for their own team, how to recreate everything or how everything is built. So they managed using the existing documentation to recreate everything very fast, even though they don't have uh, automation. But also for the application, which was uh, 
uh, quite a success about uh, implementing best practices. Like almost everyone was doing GitOps uh, with Argus or Flux V1. This was one year ago. Now a lot of people use it are using also Flux V2. Um, other users had Helm charts, but everything was packaged and co configured uh, in the values, so it was very easy to reproduce the deployment. And um, uh, that's why they were able to, to bring up the capacity in, in such a short notice. Yeah, so another thing to highlight here is that uh, you see how diverse some of the tools we use are. And this is because we have very diverse teams. We have best practices and for the, like, the most critical services, we, we, we kind of follow the same uh, policy in the terms of tools being used. But at the same time, different people have different requirements and the teams have different types of knowledge. So we don't cur currently enforce the, the kind of tool they should use. So the, the rest of the day, so now we are end of the afternoon, uh, we, sp we spent kind of looking at the tail of the issues. Uh, for most services, people realized this pretty quickly and they reacted quickly. Uh, we did realize that some things that uh, were impacted uh, didn't get an immediate reply, which probably means they are less critical, but we wanted to make sure that this was followed as well. So this was kind of the tail of the, the work here. So, <clears throat> As a summary of all of this, uh, there are some highlights to, to do. There are things that went quite well. The main one is that we had no data loss. This would be the main problem. Uh, why this happened, uh, we, we will we'll talk later a, a bit, but uh, it's, it's also like not, we, we don't have well-defined policies to, to guarantee this, unfortunately, yet. Uh, the deployments are really well managed. This is really uh, something we invested quite a bit of time in dissemination of uh, uh, GitOps uh, pr processes, not necessarily enforcing a tool, but making sure that people are aware that this should be the case, that they should be able to deploy their applications very easily. Uh, there's something that is really good uh, in one way, which is cluster creation has been optimized over the years and it's really fast. So it takes only a couple of minutes to get a new cluster, which means even in an event like this, which is pretty big, uh, we can get the capacity back pretty quickly. Uh, Multi-cluster and cluster as catalogs and workload splitting, it, it does work. Like uh, these are the cases where we, we kind of, even if we go really hard on it, uh, reducing the blast radius uh, for the full service is really a big thing. Uh, we ended up with degradation and almost no downtime. Uh, direct communication, it was also very important. Um, on the what went wrong side, uh, the Sigler dependency was the biggest issue and that caused the most stress to us after the initial assessment. But also what went wrong is that cluster deletion is also optimized and it's very fast and successful. Uh, so I, I don't know if we should do something about it to make it less, uh, less efficient. And then other things that went wrong is the, what I mentioned that some, some changes were manual like DNS uh, updates, firewall rules, etc. And also what we are slightly lacking behind apart from the use cases with Terraform is cluster bootstrapping is a manual process. So if we have something that uh, uh, consolidates all the time, uh, also that would have uh, been addressed by itself, like uh, they should have been addressed by itself. Yeah, so this, this is one of the main investments we are doing and uh, we'll talk a bit more about in the demo. Uh, Finally, like the, where we got lucky uh, the final, for the final part of this post-mortem is, is um, we kind of got overconfident about what was clearly uh, seen as a small change. We knew that the impact could be big, but it looked trivial enough to, and well-tested enough to, to, to kind of let it go. Uh, and this is something that is constantly in our minds in the, in the last few months, so we are a lot more careful and we define some criteria on how to follow these changes. Um, the other thing we get lucky is that we identified this circular dependency. The, what happened is that uh, we wanted to consolidate the service. We ended up running the registry in the service itself, just kind of grow, grown uh, by itself this idea without verifying necessarily. So what we did after is really we did a, a detailed analysis of where are the other circular dependencies that we missed over time. So this is an effort that is quite important as well. The final one is that we have no visibility on data persistency or backups. Uh, this is nice in, uh, in uh, Kubernetes, you have this 
possibility to declare snapshots and even generate backups. This is not something we have in place right now for some limitations of the integration we have with the storage systems. And it's where we are also investing a lot because this will allow us to look at the clusters and see where the data is and what's backed up, what's not, and kind of trace uh, to prevent uh, data loss in the future. In this case, we didn't have any. And another part that we invested uh, some time, apart from uh, making um, the cluster provisioning like more automated, is to change a bit our policy and never like ever delete anything on behalf of the user. If they even if they request about it, we should always delegate to them and tell them how to do it. So we never like we, we block ourselves from even being able to do it. Right, so this, this will be a very quick demo. Uh, I must confess that initially uh, the idea was to do uh, a real live production deletion of uh, a real CERN service. And discussing with colleagues involved and not involved in this incident, they said if this is a therapy session, I don't think that's a good idea because it might just ruin it. So we'll do the second best thing. Uh, I'll try to demonstrate uh, a bit what we uh, try to advertise as uh, automation of the cluster management. This is really the part that we're missing. All the services are well, well done and we understand well how to, to, to manage them. The cluster part is still a challenge. Ideally, we'll get to integrating this with Crossplane as well uh, very soon. So just a very simple uh, description of how this works. So in this case, we are relying on Argo CD. Uh, we have this bootstrap, which means we can pop up a cluster, uh, deploy this uh, in the cluster, and we'll have an Argo CD deployment, which also has a secret management service internally and manages itself Argo CD. Uh, so that's good. We also deploy uh, Argo workflows in this case, and this is because there's a lot of manual tasks where uh, you might want to go and write a CRD and a controller and do a proper reconciliation, but that can be quite a lot of tr uh, uh, work, and not all users will, will be uh, willing to to, to develop and maintain those. So the second best thing is just to offer them a way to integrate it with the uh, workflows. Uh, then we have the, the clusters uh, description. So this is the dream. Uh, it's to have one YAML file where all the clusters are defined or a couple of YAML files. And you can see here, like I have a couple of clusters uh, uh, and for each cluster we have the configuration, which is basically the version that we want to run and then some flavors for the nodes and the masters, as well as node groups definitions. A lot of these clusters are heterogeneous, so we want to create like nodes in different availability zones or different flavors, GPUs, CPUs, things like this. And then something that is really important is this part here. Um, you can define Argo CD labels, which are basically the type of workload that this cluster should be running. And this will allow us to do a kind of a matchmaking uh, with the applications without having to do a hard coding of the, the mappings. And you can see other clusters here. If we look at uh, the existing um, Argo configuration, we can see the clusters here. I have 124, 125, and I have an extra one that has nothing deployed right now. Uh, so, and you can see here all the details about how they are deployed. Again, we don't have cross-plane uh, integration yet. Uh, it will come soon. So the second best thing is to, to use a workflow for that. Uh, and then we have the services. So if we go here quickly, uh, for a service, so this is a very uh, simple example of what the service could be like. This is a serving service for a machine learning application. Uh, the, the really nice thing here, in addition to all the things I'm sure all of you that use Dargo know about, uh, is that we are using this uh, label selector so that we can match the workloads to the clusters that are saying, please give me this type of workloads. And this is really a separation of, of, uh, that, it, that is very useful in this case. And I think that's it for the description. So what I will do here, um, again, if I look at uh, the applications and I select, uh, yeah, and I select here quickly a specific project, we see we have two instances of this ML service application. It's in two different clusters. This is what we want to provide. So what we will do, we'll do two things. The first one is uh, we'll add uh, the same label, so this ML true, which means deploy ML applications in an additional cluster. And at the same time, I will also deploy a new cluster. So let's call it 10. Uh, I'll just keep the same configuration to speed up things, and I will say that I also need uh, ML in this cluster. 
So now I'll just quickly add this. Push it and just for, all right, it's there. And if I go back to, um, to my clusters, I do a refresh quickly. And you can see that it's starting to, to, to launch these new workflows. And there's two, one for uh, the previous cluster because it needs to update the labels. And there's a second one which is deploying the new cluster, which is this 010 cluster I just showed. So in the new one, we see the first pod here starting. If we look quickly at the logs, we can see that the cluster is already in progress. So this takes a couple of minutes and because we want to leave time for questions, what I will show you quickly is the changes that are being applied in the other cluster, where it's basically saying it's applying a bunch of resizes, so I'll come, come, come back to it when it registers it as well. So the way the workflow does is it tries to create a cluster. If there's a cluster, just ignores it, and then it tries to go through all the node groups, and this is what it's doing. Like for each node group, so in this case, this was node group, yeah, it's trying to resize the cluster and then applying all the changes. Again, ideally, we should uh, have this done with a proper rec reconciliation so that it's applied faster. Uh, workflows are the second best thing. And honestly, there are a lot of processes internally where it's much easier to offer workflows and offer this flexibility to users. While we wait, I'll just highlight from the Argo documentation this uh, when you start doing application sets, which are the key here. Uh, there's these different generators. One of them is this cluster generator. And this is where uh, the magic happens, which is you can define your application set and then have the labels saying where, where the application should be mapped. So let me see if this will be fast enough to, um, to actually appear. Yep, so this is the one. It's about to change the labels. It did the update, ML true. So if we go back to applications, uh, so we'll come back. I need to tunnel to CERN, so sorry about that. Uh, if we come back, we see actually an additional ML application there. So if I do ML instead of two, now we have the application running in a new, in a new cluster fully up and running and in just a couple of minutes. So this is really what we are trying to advertise to the users and uh, convince them that this is useful for their own sake as well. So yeah, it worked in the end. All right, so I think that's pretty much it what we have and we have a few minutes for questions. So happy to, to answer. Ah, yeah, yeah. So just ending here with a, another quote from, from our nice users that say in the end it was a chaos. Uh, chaos monkey test uh, and we kind of passed it so it's it's really nice so yeah any questions yeah yeah i have a question regarding um i imagine that you had uh, persistent volumes in the clusters, and I know that, for example, using Ceph, you have a reference with the image ID. But if you lose the cluster, then you, how did you recover that image ID to, to recreate the, the persistent volume connected to the right Ceph image, RBD, for example? Right, so for, for, for Ceph, uh, there's two steps. One is the provisioning of the volumes. The second one is the um, attaching of the volumes. So in most cases, people use uh, provisioning, but then they reuse the provisioned volumes, meaning that you can actually uh, mount the application in multiple uh, clusters. If you're doing RBD, this is much more complicated. Uh, so that's why actually the usage of CephFS at CERN for Kubernetes is much larger than the, the usage of RBD itself uh, because you can have this multi-attach uh, much easier. Okay, so basically you didn't have uh, uh, these um, RBD Look, images, right? There were cases, but you can also have multi-attach in RBD, but it's done differently. It's like kind of a active-passive mode instead of having multi-attach. Yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you. Uh, quick question. How did you end up solving your circular dependency on Harbor? So what, what's the solution that you chose? That's a very good question. Uh, should I answer? Uh, so uh, 
Yeah, the solution is, was like kind of obvious. Like you can have a second backup of the images outside, so in another registry. So this is in the end the, the, the solution. Yeah, and the service, the service itself allows us to specify the registry where the core images should come from. So we can flip that. When you launch a cluster, you can choose which backend registry should be used for the core images. Uh, so right now we have the core, the main registry, we have a replica on-premises, and we have a replica of the core images in an external registry outside CERN as well for, for a uh, disaster recovery. Thanks, makes sense. Yeah, it's a good question.